Hey guys, I'm Daskro, and we're going to talk about Battlefield 3 and Battlefield 4 competitive esports. What the future may hold for Battlefield franchise and some ideas and discussions. First and foremost, a little bit about myself. I've been playing competitive Battlefield or Battlefield esports for the last 10 years now, mostly for the team 20ID. I also do YouTube commentaries, competitive shoutcasts, try to bolster that competitive community. I bring up Team 20 ID because 20 ID was responsible for the first Battlefield 2 Pro Mod. And I bring this up because Battlefield 2 Pro Mod attempted to create changes within the Battlefield game to make it more competitive. And I want to talk about this as sort of the starting point. So that when I talk about what my thoughts are on Battlefield 3 competitive esports and Battlefield 4 as a future game, you may have a better understanding where I'm coming from. So first and foremost, Battlefield 2 Pro Mod. This was created several years ago, and it had a number of changes that you can all check out in the big change log below. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these changes in generalities. If you want to check out the whole change log, just read the, the, it below. There's a lot of detail there. What did the Battlefield 2 Pro Mod really do? Well, it really did three things. The first thing it did was it reduced randomness. The second thing it did was it made the classes more viable. And then three, it at attempted to reduce the effectiveness of tactics and strategies that really had no hard counter to stop. So what am I talking about? The first thing is reduced randomness. When we think of randomness in Battlefield 3, what do we think about? We think about the idea that there's all those bullet spread and it's really annoying, and it's unpredictable, and that randomness creates problems. In Battlefield 2, we also had a bolt spread issue, but there was another issue, a second issue that was just as important, that was the randomness of spawn locations. You see, in Battlefield 2, there were a number of spawn locations, both at, at, at key capture points and at key bases, that were really far off from where everyone else would spawn in. And because of that unique or outlier location, you could get a huge amount of timing advantage when running or getting into a vehicle or going to another point or whatever it may be. And so the first thing that we did in Battlefield 2 Pro Mod was to eliminate these outlier spawn locations so it was much more even. It, it didn't, the win or loss of a given capture point was not dependent on if you could spawn in a given location. And then we also, as I sort of alluded to before, Try to reduce the amount of, of bullet spread associated with the gun so that bullet spread was more of an issue at longer distances, but at shorter distances it wasn't much of a problem. So that was the first thing that we did. But what was the second thing? The second thing in this case was to make the classes more viable. Now if you've ever played in a competitive Battlefield 3 match, you'll see what I'm about to talk about. What is it? You guys know. It's the fact that if you look at, at larger game types like 8v8 or 10v10 or 12v12, almost every class being played is what? It's Engineer and it's Assault. Those two really cover the full spectrum of things and Battlefield 2 is no different. Unlike Battlefield 3, there were six classes for Battlefield 2. Six. And of which, only about three or so were actually kind of important. What were they? Uh, it was the Assault class, it was the Engineer class, and it was the Anti-Tank class. The Support class wasn't really used, the Spec Ops class was specialized, or Niche and the Recon class was uh, pretty worthless. And why was that? Well, it was because that even though that all these classes had their advantages in one respect or another, some classes had such overwhelmingly advantages, overwhelming advantages rather, excuse me, that because of that, the opportunity cost of choosing our class wasn't worth it. Let me give you an example. So in Battlefield 2, the Assault class had uh, a lot of magazines, a lot of gun magazines, so they didn't have to get ammo that much. And on top of that, the gun was super powerful. Because of that, the, the need for a support class, for instance, wasn't really there. Because the Assault class had two grenades already, it had a bunch of magazines, the Engineer class had a bunch of rockets already, and so what we tried to do to change this was to reduce the mag count and grenade count the assault class had because this now made the assault class depend on the support class. We suddenly made the support class more viable, but we also went a step further. The engineer and anti-tank uh, classes had guns that were very powerful 
and as such, uh, uh, some had uh, one class had shotguns, other class had PDWs. We made the PDWs a whole lot less powerful than what they originally were in the vanilla game, so that when a player made the conscious choice of going that given class, they had to think to themselves, "Hey, if I go this class, I'm going to be very effective against tanks, but." I'm not going to be effective against infantry. That's called opportunity costs. I am going to lose something in the process of deciding to choose one over another. And really this, to me, really gets to the heart of what the philosophy of the Battlefield franchise is all about. It's about this idea of rock, paper, scissors, combined arms. This idea that a jet takes out a helicopter, a helicopter takes out a tank, a tank takes out a, a little vehicle, uh, like a, a jeep, the jeep can take out inventory, the inventory can take out inventory, and it all goes in a big circle. When we break that circle, when when one of those elements is so much more powerful than the others, that, that they don't have hard counters, it, it actually ruins that combined arms element. And because of that, we made a number of changes to the assault class and the engineer and AT class to make spec ops class more viable, to make the support class more viable. Recon class was a little bit more difficult, but we attempted to make some of these changes. And I'm not saying we got it 100% right. We didn't, but we got closer to that balancing element. And the same applies for vehicles as well. In Battlefield 2, the commander could drop down these big supply boxes. The supply boxes did a few things. It gave you ammo, gave you health, and then for vehicles, it gave them ammo and it gave them uh, repair tool stuff. So you could actually, it was an aura, so you could get next to that as, as a vehicle and get repaired while you're doing it. And so that was really powerful and it made the vehicles so important to have because with a good commander, you could, you didn't need a big engineering crew to, to help it go and you could just put that box down and let it self-repair. So we also made tweaks to that as well so that the aura wasn't as powerful. We did those things because we wanted it more balanced. The third thing that we did, the third thing that we did was to try to make the tactics and strategies that were really didn't have any hard counters less effective. What do I mean by this? We don't really don't see this in Battlefield 3 that much, but uh, let me give you an example. So in Battlefield 2, you had two attack helicopters. Attack helicopters would fight each other. One attack helicopter would go down. The team that was victorious would look at the timer. In Battlefield 2, there was a timer at the top, and they'd say, okay, this timer went down at the 12 minute mark. We know that helicopter is going to respawn in in a minute, perhaps. We know that if I'm a certain distance from that helicopter pad where it's going to respawn, that if I fire at, let's say, 55 seconds, that by the time my TV missile from my helicopter makes its way to that helo pad, that helicopter is going to respawn. And the moment it respawns, that, that TV missile blows out that helicopter and gets spawn camped. That was a big deal in competitive play. Some leagues disallowed this tactic, but a lot didn't. And as such, we said, hey, we, th this, there's, no hard, there's no way to stop it. The, the helicopter is way, way far out. And because of that, we need to be able to change this. And so we changed the, the, uh, the damage of the TV missile from a one-hit kill to a less than one-hit kill. Likewise, the commander could rain down an artillery barrage on that enemy hel helipad. And because of that, we said, well, we, we have to make it so that when that barrage comes and hits that helicopter, even if it spawns in, it's not going to destroy it in one barrage. It gives the losing team a chance to at least get up in the air and have a, a somewhat of a fair fight. We try to do those, those kinds of things so that it was a more fun experience, it was more balanced, and it was a, and it, it made it more interesting. It, it really emphasized that combined arms element and still made it fun. But all this being said about Battlefield 2 Pro Mod, it begs the question for me of why we even had to do it. We had to create the Battlefield 2 Pro Mod because no one else was going to do it. And that's a big concern to me. And, to, and I think as you'll uh, understand as I talk more about this, why this is such a big deal. You see, I think eSports is a lot of fun. I really enjoy the competitive nature of playing against competent, proficient opponents, learning the maps, learning the teamwork and coordination associated with winning as a team, playing that objective. And because of that, 
I want more people to do it. We talk about sometimes these ideas of battlefield moments, the idea that you're in a pub and you're, you're fighting it out and there's a combined arms, you got the helicopter in the air, the tank right next to you, and you're fighting it out and you have these larger-than-life battles, these battles that are so, for lack of a better word, epic in nature, that you're playing for those moments because they are so much fun. When you capture them, when you see them, they are just, they're, they're unbelievable. And you may play in a public server for hours and experience this once or twice, and that's about the end of it. In competitive matches, you experience these constantly because you're playing with your friends, with your teammates, and you're playing against other teams that are just as competent. And because of that, these moments happen all the time. They're glorious. They really are glorious. That's why I play these you know, competitive events and matches. And because of this, I want the Battlefield franchise to be a premier esports title. It's not there. It most certainly is not. But I believe that if, if more people play competitive matches, they'll find that it is so much fun, it's so much more fun than playing, playing in public servers that they'll, they too will want to form a team, form a platoon, join a squad, and play in these kinds of organized events. But I think that there's three things that have to be accomplished for any successful esports title. Three things are what? One, is the game fun? Is the game balanced? And is the game accessible? First and foremost, is the game fun? Now, fun means different things for different players. Fun for someone like me who has played competitively for a decade now in the Battlefield franchise and have an established group of friends that I play with is going to be a whole lot different than the guy who plays only on the weekends. Plays solo, doesn't get on a TeamSpeak server or whatever it may be. He plays for an hour or two, he shoots down a shopper or whatever, and he gets done and he feels satisfied. Two different ideas of fun there. It also has to be fun for both the, you know, the casual bro gamer who wants to play with his, his friends and they're all sort of average in, in, uh, in skill set versus the guy who is super focused on stat padding. It has to be fun against uh, across a, an entire spectrum of, of ideas of what fun represents. Because if the game isn't fun, people don't play the game. If people don't play the game, then you're not going to have that many players to pull or generate to create a competitive scene in the first place. When we look at a game like League of Legends, League of Legends has millions of people that play it. Millions. And it's a free, accessible game that allows, that's a lot of fun and allows people to, to uh, really enjoy themselves. And because of that big player base, a competitive scene has, uh, has risen from it. So that's the first thing. It has to be fun. Two, it has to be balanced. This one is most certainly difficult. Let's talk about the Battlefield 2 Pro Mod a bit more. We created a, an attempt at a balanced game, but in the context of only 8v8 or 10v10 competitive play. Most certainly, in this respect, our choices in terms of the changes that we viewed as, as, as balance had negative impacts on larger gameplay types, like 32 versus 32, for instance. Think about that. When you make certain changes to the game, it may have very positive impacts to certain game modes, game types, team sizes, but it may have huge negative impacts to others. Let me give you an example in StarCraft. StarCraft, big RTS game, StarCraft, in this franchise, Blizzard has supported balancing the original StarCraft game for over 10 years now. They have a dedicated balancing step, and they make changes every few months to try to make it balanced. But the problem with creating a balanced game is that, especially with StarCraft, they have to do it accommodating both the really high-end competitive pro players and the casual players. In this respect, there will be instances in which there will be a, uh, a, uh, a race or a unit in StarCraft that is super powerful, even in balance for those high-end competitive players. But to the casual player that maybe plays once a week, 
they don't see it as a problem at all. And you can flip it on it in the sense that there may be certain tactics or strategies that are really effective against really uh, average or below average players, but really are inconsequential to that high-end competitive play. It's really hard to balance that. And how does, how does StarCraft do it? Well, in StarCraft II, they do it through analyzing all the metadata associated with people playing the game. They look at win-loss ratio for each individual race across a spectrum of skill sets, anywhere from the Bronze League all the way up to the top 200 super pro players. And they say, oh, well, we can look at this and say that there are certain races at certain skill tiers that are better than others, and why is that? And they can investigate that and try to make incremental changes that create more balance, not just within that given skill tier, but across the board as well. And because of this, uh, it makes it very difficult. Creating balance isn't a instinct, it's a process. And because of this, DICE has, <laughs> they have a lot ahead of them in this respect. In StarCraft, what do they focus on? They don't focus on 2v2 or 3v3 or 4v4 team play or even free-for-all. They focus on 1v1 team play, excuse me, 1v1, not team play, exclusively. Because of this, they are aware that any balancing changes that they make within this 1v1 will most certainly, most certainly have a negative impact on the 2v2 or 3v3 team play. And they acknowledge that. They understand that. But they understand that balancing for them is focused on that one type of gameplay. Battlefield, as I said before, has a lot ahead of them in this respect. They have multiple gameplay types, be it Conquest or Squad Rush or Conquest Large or Regular Rush or all the new niche modes like, uh, like Scavenger Mode or uh, like Gunmaster. They also have all the different guns out there within the classes as well as the different balancing issues across the classes. Oh, and they also have vehicles. It's a combined arm arms game. You, do you see how difficult it could be to create this sort of balance that accommodates a, a broad spectrum of players who all play different gameplay types with different team sizes? It's very difficult for them to do it. And so it... it it, it forces them to sort of have to make these compromises. And by compromising across the board, it actually doesn't, it doesn't really satisfy anyone in that respect. What's the third thing that I talked about? The third idea in a successive eSports title is accessibility. Accessibility means multiple things. The first and foremost thing is when the competitive eSport title is successful, it has to be accessible to anyone who wants to play it. It means that the game that you're playing as a casual player is identical to the game the pro player's playing. When you look at League of Legends, for instance, or StarCraft II, there aren't items that are disallowed or tactics that are, that are banned. There aren't certain variables that are changed or, or certain settings that are, that are tweaked. No. The game, for the most part, is identical to what the pro player plays versus what the casual player plays. Battlefield with the pro mod, not the case. By creating a pro mod, you are creating an exclusive subset, a subculture, if you will, that is purposefully firewalling themselves from the general casual gaming population. You are now putting in a number of variables and a number of aspects that requires these casual players, these non-competitive players, to make a very ugly and very difficult transition. Because all the things that they had learned, that they had, you know, think that they're sort of mastering through this gaming process, be it unlocks or stats, whatever it may be, it doesn't necessarily apply. And that can be a really big hindrance to accessibility. The second aspect of accessibility also talks about this idea of uh, the idea that there is a transition from casual to competitive. League of Legends has the StarCraft II has this, what is it? It's a ladder system. It's a matchmaking system. It's an ELO, which is a, 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 a metric that states you know, how good you are. 
to, it's not based off of stats. It's not or not based on stat grinding or just by playing the game a lot. It's by win to loss ratio of who you're playing against. So you're playing against good players. You're playing against bad players. When you create this this metric system, there's no gaming the system. The best players rise to the top. The ones that are okay but love the stat pad, they don't rise to the top. We see this in StarCraft II. We see this in League of Legends. It's about players who constantly challenge themselves against better players. And if they're successful, they rise up. If they're unsuccessful, they stay in a given tier. In this respect, Battlefield has a lot going for it already. Battlelog as an application already has platoon set up for, for, for squads and teams. It already has a match system that with a little bit of tweaking could be created. We could take the ESL system right now, which is a versus system, which already is integrated into Battlelog and just bring that in-house. No offense to ESL, but we have to get as many people interested as it can. If you do it inside Battlelog, you're going to get that, that amount of people interested in playing it. You create this so that there are an ability for players to find these competitive matches organically. They don't have to go out to a third-party website. They can go within Battlelog and challenge themselves and hopefully get better. It also means creating additional incentives for it. Right now, we have a, a big incentive system that is focused around grinding. This idea that you put in enough time and effort on a certain type of ability, so many headshots, so many uh, revives, whatever it may be, then you have made a progression and you are thus better and hooray, you feel good about yourself. Now, personally, I, I don't agree with a lot of that, that philosophy. I think it's actually very detrimental to uh, gaming, generally speaking. But it's what it is, and I'm not going to argue that in this episode. But what I will say is that you can utilize these same concepts for matches. Players who knowingly put themselves up against opponents that, that very well may be better than them, should be incentivized to do so. They should be rewarded for challenging themselves. Give them a ribbon, give them an unlock. Give them a, a medal. Give them a special dog tag, I don't care. Give them something to recognize the fact that they are not just going into the same sewer they always like to play in and, and getting the same KDR and getting the same amount of points and getting the same whatever. Instead, you know, make them get outside their comfort zone and play against players that may beat them. Guys, it's okay to lose. It's okay to lose because that's how you become a better player. That's how you get more fun out of it. It's not just about killing dudes. It's about becoming a better player. Learning from your losses, learning from your experiences, and increasing your skills and abilities. So those are the three things that really make a successive esports title, in my view. So how does this apply to Battlefield? Well, First and foremost, continue to make the game fun. I think Battlefield 3 is a really fun game. Hopefully Battlefield 4 is going to be a fun game as well. The balancing stuff, a little bit more complicated. Well, I know DICE has a big QA team that they bring in, and they also have closed betas and things like that to try to balance the game. I really hope that they create a more broad spectrum of QA testers. Bring in really highly skilled top 1% competitive players. Bring in very top, you know, bottom 1% really bad players. We have to be able to create that balance across a wide spectrum of players so that the experience is fun for everyone. Right now in Battlefield 3, we, we, we have issues with that. For instance, the IFV is, is very imbalanced for other vehicles, or the M16 or AK is, is just a bit more effective than every other assault gun on there. That's the weapon of choice. These imbalances you know, have to be created so that, so that people aren't mad that, oh, the, I, I just got gypped because I got killed by something that I view as an imbalance. We need to want to try to be able to minimize that. So bring in the QA testers. You need to be paid. You can bring in these competitive, competitive gamers like myself, although I'm not saying you got to put me in, and you know, make them sign NDAs, make them play the game, really find out the bugs and the glitches, and try to solve it. StarCraft II did that uh, very successfully with a very long beta that included a number of, of players, tens of thousands of players, including very, very highly skilled ones at that. 
bring it in to try to create this balance, try to create that viability. I want to see all the classes used. Even though that right now in competitive gaming, recon class is very rarely used, I want to see it used more. I want to see sport class used more. I want to see the classes used more. I want to see the vehicles used more. I want everything to be viable, everything to be fun. And finally, the accessibility. As I mentioned before, we need to be able to create a, a better matchmaking system. We want to be able to create incentives so that people are interested in playing it. We already have the tools available. Battlelog already has a fantastic social media system that allows you to very easily create platoons and matches. It's all there. We just need to put it together. Those are my suggestions for competitive battlefield and its future. And I hope you enjoyed this little conversation. I know I did. So uh, until next time, guys. You may have a better understanding where I'm coming from. So first and foremost, Battlefield 2 Pro Mod. This was created several years ago, and it had a number of changes that you can all check out in the big change log below. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these changes in generalities. If you want to check out the whole change log, just read the, the, it below. There's a lot of detail there. What did the Battlefield 2 Pro Mod really do? Well, it really did three things. The first thing it did was it reduced randomness. The second thing it did was it made the classes more viable. And then three, it at attempted to reduce the effectiveness of tactics and strategies that really had no hard counter to stop. So what am I talking about? The first thing is reduced randomness. When we think of randomness in Battlefield 3, what do we think about? We think about the idea that of which only about three or so were actually kind of important. What were they? Uh, it was the assault class, it was the engineer class, and it was the anti-tank class. The support class wasn't really used, the spec ops class was specialized, or niche in the recon class was uh, pretty worthless. And why was that? Well, it was because that even though that all these classes had their advantages in one respect or another, some classes had such overwhelmingly advantages, overwhelming advantages rather, excuse me, that because of that, the opportunity cost of choosing our class wasn't worth it. Let me give you an example. So in Battlefield 2, the assault class had uh, a lot of magazines, a lot of gun magazines, so they didn't have to get ammo that much. And on top of that, the gun was super powerful. Hey guys, I'm Daskro, and we're going to talk about Battlefield 3 and Battlefield 4 competitive esports, what the future may hold for Battlefield franchise, and some ideas and discussions. First and foremost, a little bit about myself. I've been playing competitive Battlefield or Battlefield esports for the last 10 years now, mostly for the team 20ID. I also do YouTube commentaries, competitive shoutcasts, try to bolster that competitive community. I bring up Team 20 ID because 20 ID was responsible for the first Battlefield 2 Pro Mod. And I bring this up because Battlefield 2 Pro Mod attempted to create changes within the Battlefield game to make it more competitive. And I want to talk about this as sort of the starting point. So that when I talk about what my thoughts are on Battlefield 3 competitive esports and Battlefield 4 as a future game, there's all those bullets spread and it's really annoying, and it's unpredictable, and that randomness creates problems. In Battlefield 2, we also had a bolt spread issue, but there was another issue, a second issue that was just as important, that was the randomness of spawn locations. You see, in Battlefield 2, there were a number of spawn locations, both at, at, at key capture points and at key bases, that were really far off from where everyone else would spawn in. And because of that unique or outlier location, you could get a huge amount of timing advantage when running or getting into a vehicle or going to another point or whatever it may be. And so the first thing that we did in Battlefield 2 Pro Mod was to eliminate these outlier spawn locations so it was much more even. It, it didn't, the win or loss of a given capture point was not dependent on if you could spawn in a given location. And then we also, as I sort of alluded to before, Try to reduce the amount of, of bullet spread associated with the gun so that bullet spread was more of an issue at longer distances, but at shorter distances it wasn't much of a problem. So that was the first thing that we did. But what was the second thing? The second thing in this case was to make the classes more viable. Now if you've ever played in a competitive Battlefield 3 match, you'll see what I'm about to talk about. What is it? 
you guys know, it's the fact that if you look at, at larger game types like 8v8 or 10v10 or 12v12, almost every class being played is what? It's Engineer and it's Assault. Those two really cover the full spectrum of things, and Battlefield 2 is no different. Unlike Battlefield 3, there were six classes for Battlefield 2. Six. And 